Welcome to Point to Rise, your podcast that gives you permission to dream big, take messy action, and turn your talent into profit while turning your back on perfection. My name is Suzanne Purcell, high performance and mindset coach, former international ballerina, profitable entrepreneur, and founder of Point to Rise, a movement designed to empower dancers. It is my mission to use my own story as an inspiration for today's generation of dancers. And now sit back, stretch, warm up, or zip your coffee and love learning how much it matters to point at yourself first to rise to all that you are capable of. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Point to Rise podcast. I am so happy um, that you have turned in and I'm actually want to take that happy out. I am so grateful that you have tuned in today. Today, I am so excited to have a conversation with Kathleen McGuire Gaines. She is the founder of We Are Minding. Kathleen is a former dancer, a writer, and a mental health advocate for dancers. As a dancer, Kathleen trained at the Pittsburgh Ballet Theater School and the San Francisco Ballet School in their professional division and she also spent summers at the School of American Bali and the Chautauqua Festival Volga. Over the last 10 years Kathleen has written more than 150 articles on dance for Dance Magazine, Point, Dance Spirit and Dance Teacher Magazine. Minding the Gap was founded as a reaction to the outpouring of support Kathleen received after she posted the article why are we still so bad at addressing dancers' mental health on the Dance Magazine website in the summer of 2017? Her ambition is to enhance and enact a movement with results in mental health being regarded with the same seriousness as physical health in the dance culture. I am so thrilled to have this conversation with her, to share it with you. Because the more and more and more we're talking about these issues, um, the more we're going to turn the needle and the more we are going to find solutions on how we can do it better. Her recent article in the dance magazine, COVID Silver Linings, Seven Ways the Pandemic Has Changed Us for the Better, is a really, really good read to change perhaps your perspective on the pandemic or over the past year that all the things that we have not had sometimes can can get us down and and really be in our face and with actually looking at the other side of the medal that there are also good things that happened um that this is a pause that was long overdue for the bali and dance world so without no further ado, no more rambling, let's get into the episode. Take your coffee, take your smoothie, whatever you need to drink right now, sit down, move, do whatever you need to do, but listen all the way to the end. Here we go. Kathleen, thank you so much for being here today. I have been looking forward to this conversation after our last conversation that we had offline so very much. Um, where to start, my love? So. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys don't know her, she has been writing for Dance Magazine and Spirit Magazine and Point Magazine and Dance Teacher Magazine, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I got this right? Okay, good. Mm -hmm. um, for some time now, over 150 articles. Um, and let's start at the beginning. Why did you start dancing? Like, what was mm. that in you? What drew you to it? What drew me to dancing? I think um, it's interesting now that I have my own child. It's it's so obvious, you know, um, because they just unapologetically move when when something moves them, right? And so I think I was very moved <laughs> as a young child, um, and I really enjoyed um, dancing. And my parents noticed it, so I was enrolled in creative movement very young, like a lot of us were, I think. Um, and I joke that I just never grew out of wanting to become a ballerina. <laughs> it seemed like a lot of the, uh, the others in my class did, and I just kind of never did. Um, I, yeah, I started dancing cause I loved it. I started dancing cause in its best 
moments. It's the most natural freeing thing in the world, I think. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. There's nothing else that connects us better to our higher self than twirling around and just letting it throw through, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've actually in the, during the pandemic, I have, I have had nights where I've just had to blast music in my kitchen and just, and just dance like an idiot. Like you just yeah. got to get it out. Like <laughs> it feels really good. <laughs> it does feel really good. Yeah. And it even feels better if you don't judge yourself around it. Exactly. And now at the ripe old age of 37, <laughs> I am, oh, I am, <laughs> no, I, I, um, I'm finally coming to a place where I can do that, but it's taken a really long time and it's been a really long journey and a lot of hard work, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll get into this. Okay, that's the first, before we do that, I'm going to make a mental note here. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> talk about where, where you danced, how you got into the professional field and what that was like. Sure. Where, like your personal experience. Absolutely. Um, so I grew up in a, in a, well, a small city in New York, Binghamton, New York. Um, and, you know, I went to a, a small school there. Um, and when I was, I started doing summer programs when I was 10. Um, when I was 14, I left home to train with Pittsburgh Ballet Theater School. Um, and I was there for three years and until uh, yeah, 17, I went to San Francisco Ballet School in their pre-professional program. Um, and I did my summers at School of American Ballet in Chautauqua. And, um, you know, I was in a very highly competitive environment at a very, very young age. Um, you know, I, I left home very young. I was, I was really serious. I was like, I'm, I need to be in the best school now. I need to get better now, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I might, I, you know, looking back, I might've done it a little bit differently, but, um, you know, I was never a very confident dancer. Um, I never really fully believed in myself. I really needed the people at the front of the room to tell me I was doing great, that I looked good. Um, and that's a really dangerous place, I think, for any dancer to exist, um, for any human to exist. But um, for dancers, I think can be particularly challenging. I, um, in San Francisco, I, it was right around Nutcracker. We we're getting ready for Nutcracker. So it was probably September. It was fairly early on in my first year there. I um, suffered from my first injury, which was a stress fracture to my second metatarsal, the famous point shoe injury, um, which I got because I wasn't properly nourishing or resting my body. <laughs> um, and, you know, that moment really, well, I had lacked a lot of confidence in my dancing prior. That was really the moment that led me to my first major depression. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I went from being in the highest level at San Francisco Ballet School, you know, rehearsing company roles for Nutcracker. You know, I was, I was there, like I was, I could smell my dreams, right? Um, and, and then I got injured and I just, kind of vaporized like I just felt like I just felt like it disappeared and um and I'll be honest there were some there were some things about the way injuries were handled at that time the leadership of the school has changed since I was there so you know I, I can't speak to what it's like now um but you know I was required to sit in every single class that I couldn't dance in and write down all the combinations and all the corrections and hand them in at the office at the end of class. So for eight weeks, I had to sit and just watch my peers keep going without me. Um, I think that that's, it's a really good example of a situation where like the intention isn't harmful. Like the intention is, well, you can't dance. So you're going to continue to learn in this manner. And I'm not saying there isn't a benefit to watching some classes and, and writing combinations, et cetera, but it was very harmful. <laughs> um, so during this period of time, I, I, I became very depressed. I started kind of yo-yoing with my eating, going from, you know, not a full on eating disorder, but very disordered eating patterns um, to just eating everything in sight and um, you know, going to parties and doing drugs because they made me feel better. And oh goodness, all these horrible 
coping skills that I learned essentially from the people around me because there was no one showing me positive coping skills. My family was 3000 miles away. I lived in an apartment, you know, 17, like, um, and it was really hard. And I just really struggled to come back from that. I really, really struggled to come back from that. Um, you know, yeah, <laughs> I think that's as far as I'm going to go on that one right now. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And and I'm just going to throw that in there. I've been in this absolutely same boat, not because of injury, just the coping mechanism, because I couldn't deal with my unworthiness. Mm-hmm. I didn't know how to. I didn't even know it was showing up, but um, I was highly addicted to um, nicotine. Like it was at least a pack of cigarettes a day, which as a dancer is, yeah, you do the math. Um, I was drinking a lot. I was not eating. I was in relationships that were um, harmful, like physical abuse, mental abuse. Um, and I didn't do anything about it because I felt so unworthy. So y- you're not alone um, mm-hmm. in in that kind of. And mm-hmm. I, for me, it went as far as um, I actually took sleeping tablets because I didn't want to live anymore. Yeah. Which actually was only a cry for help because I wanted to be seen so badly. Mm-hmm. Um. Can we let's make let's make something good out of this? Mm-hmm. This just because that is really heavy and it can be really heavy for people that are, you know, listening. Yeah. If you could go back, like, what would you do differently? Like, even mm-hmm. with like with the knowledge that you have right now, mm-hmm. what would you be d- doing differently, or um, as yourself, or as somebody that you're watching? Like, what would you tell that person? Yeah. I mean, and it's interesting because it's like, I have the benefit of, of everything I've learned over the course of writing and working on Minding the Gap. Um, I also have the benefit of not being 17 anymore, you yeah. know? <laughs> um, so how much of it would have sunk in? I'm not totally sure. Um, I think most importantly, just because you think something doesn't mean it's true. Um that's something my colleague, Dr. Lee Scavarlo says often, and I just love it. And I still, to this day, stop myself and say, what was that? What was that thought? Like, it's not true, right? Like you, your thoughts are not facts. And, you know, I think especially when you're younger and when you're trying to please others, so like so many dancers do, and especially so many females do, women do, um, it's, it's very easy to get into this like cycle of, well, they hate me. Well, that was terrible. Now I'm never, you know, and you can kind of get into this thought cycle that is really damaging and not serving you, you know? So I think, I think self-talk is maybe one of the most powerful things a young dancer can shift and something I really wish somebody at some point had just said, like, what you're thinking isn't true just you know like it's not and and then if if you're having a negative thought I'm the worst dancer in this class well is that thought helping you is it is it because maybe it is you know for some people maybe it's like yeah it's motivating the heck out of me and here I go and I'm working so hard because I'm going to prove them wrong you know but then for others it's just completely defeating like is that thought actually helping me and so I think I think that is like the very beginning of the seed of self-esteem. And I really wish that I would, I would try and part that on myself. And then the next, you know, progression from that is just because your teacher says it doesn't mean it's true. (laughs) Just because your partner says it doesn't mean it's true. (laughs) Um, So I think that's, I think that would be, would have been a very kind of, life-changing perspective for me beautiful so when we're when we're in this like self-talk and and this is all um self-development right like and we can we can 
we can choose even to teach our 12 and 13 and 14 year olds in school, or even if they're 10, I'm doing it with my children, um, to, to implement all of these high performing habits into their daily routine. And a school can do this, teachers can do this at any given point. All they have to do is to A, have the awareness that actually exists and what kind of a difference it makes. And then they need to choose to do it. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and I strongly believe for me, and I, I would think that for you too, it would have made a world of a difference in my career as a dancer if I would have had these tools. Mm -hmm. It's, and they're so simple. You know, most of the, most of the best advice that I get from psychologists around mental health skills um, are so, I mean, self-talk, that's so simple. Like, but most people don't even recognize you're having a thought, you know, like, it's just, it's just this, this stream running through your, your head. Whereas if you practice and it does take practice, you can actually pick those things out and be like, whoa, 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 you slow down here. Where are you going? That's that's not, what is this, you know? Um, but it, it, it takes practice. And I think any of it, goal, goal setting, I mean, there's so many things. These are such, once they're laid out to you, yeah. simple and obvious. It, they're, it's the TheraBand that you should be using before you need surgery, you know, like. Yes. This is going like these daily tools, these habits, they actually align with the high performance um, was that culture that is in the ballet world. And I don't understand yet why we think that athletes need them, but dancers don't. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't make sense. We were, we're so concentrated on, um, okay, so you need to do uh, 500 sit-ups before you start your class and you need to do, I don't know, 500 crunches after you're done with class. And then you're going to go and do Pilates and you're going to do another rehearsal and you're going to study these variations when you're at home, when you're already exhausted. Um, and we're not putting any empath empath that's a hard word for a German girl. <laughs> no empathy into how capable our mind actually is and how much it actually stems from our mindset and, and, and how we think and mm -hmm. how we behave and how much aware we are um, in our performance ability. Like it doesn't make sense. And we're just, we're learning. I don't know. We're not, we're now finally talking about it. Um, and I want to see change. So let's get into you and your entrepreneurial um, ventures. Um, I would love to share how you got into writing and the why behind We Are Minding. Sure. So how I got into writing, um, I, during that difficult time in San Francisco, I kept a very detailed journal, um, which is pretty terrifying to look at now. <laughs> but grounding as well. Um, I kept a very detailed journal. And when I stopped dancing a few years later, I didn't know who I was. I had developed no identity outside of dance. I, I had no idea who I was. And my mom asked me, I remember I was like, well, I'm going to go to college, but what am I going to do in college? You know, like I'm not, and I had decided no dancing. Like I was done with dance. Like for me, it was like, it was all or nothing. And I was at the nothing point. I could have nothing to do with it. Um, so I, um, my mom asked me what, well, what else makes you happy? Like, what else do you enjoy? And you know, that should not be a hard question. <laughs> it is for dancers to answer. It very, is. Yeah, it very. Yeah. Very. Yeah. But I realized that one thing that made me feel better when I was really sad was writing in this journal. And I'm, you know, it's like the one positive thing I did for myself, I think. And I, and I, I did it just to vent, you know, I didn't even realize that I was utilizing a coping strategy, right? Like, um, but I was, and I really enjoyed it. And, you know, people would say things like, oh, you have a way with words and stuff like that. So I was like, well, I'll go to school for writing. So I went to school for writing. I majored in fiction because I didn't want to have to write about dance and I was afraid in nonfiction. 
have to write about dance. <laughs> oh, this is so good. <laughs> yeah. And then in fiction class, they were like, oh, right, what you know? Where's your story about dance? And I was just like, oh, man. So, <laughs> so then I started taking taking nonfiction as well and some journalism. And, um, and I actually fell madly in love with nonfiction writing. And when I, I graduated just in time for the recession, yay. yay. <laughs> and um, graduated from college during the recession, started a business during the pandemic. I, I'm like, awesome. Like, my timing's great. Total ground. No, no. <laughs> it's the best timing ever. If you look at history, all the big companies, and I'm, I'm telling you, all the big, big kahunas, the ones that are really, really successful, were founded during a success, every session. Interesting. Or maybe there's something them. about, maybe there's something about the way you have to like scrap and strive and yeah. Um, so I, um, I went to the University of Pittsburgh and I got a writing degree fantastic program. I loved it. And when I graduated, I, I was working in retail and, you know, it was a decent job and I had some money and, but getting started in writing is hard. It's like, you have to be published to get published. And you're kind of like, how do I get on this carousel? And so I was like, I think I should try and get an internship, like with a magazine or something, because I love magazines. Like I am a magazine junkie. It's about, you see me on an airplane, I've got like seven magazines. I love I love the good ones. I love the trashy ones. I love magazines. <laughs> and um, so I saw uh, an opportunity to apply for an internship with Dance Magazine. And I was like, well, I mean, I know about dance, so maybe they'll accept me. Um, and they did. And for me, it was really like at, when I walked through the door on that first day, it was like, OK, I just have to get through this. Like it's a means to an end. Right. I just and I I fell in love with dance writing. Um, you know, I discovered that having a voice in dance, well, one felt very empowering, you know, to, to be in a space where I felt so muted and canceled and forgotten mm -hmm. to be able to speak out loud using actual words in that space um, is an incredibly freeing and therapeutic thing for me. Um, but in addition, I started really loving that I could ponder on the questions and the things and like the, what did you, what do you wish you had known or what do you wish you could have learned um, and really dig into them. And, and every article I've written has come from a place of, I wish I had known this or I wish someone had told me this. Um, and so I, I really fell in love with that process. Um, and because all Dance Magazine, Dance Media owns Dance Magazine Point, um, Dance Teacher, Dance Spirit, um, you know, when you're doing fairly well for one, you kind of, you will start kind of getting passed around. So I started looking at it through different lenses, even, you know, through the lens of a teacher, dance spirit being kind of younger and competition dancers. And, um, so that was an interesting practice as well. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how I got into it. It was completely by accident. <laughs> well, if I connect the dots backwards, nothing is an accident, quite honestly. Like it is like the perfect path. You went through, you know, the pain. That's your gift. Mm. Now it is what you're you you made into a new career. And it's because you leaned in and you ask yourself the right questions. So I know it only makes sense when you connect the dots backwards. You can't connect them forward. It's just not possible. However, it's that trust. Mm. Um, yeah, just following your gut and what feels right. Yeah. And, and kind of leaning into vulnerability, right? Like if, uh -huh. yeah, right. <laughs> if okay. I can Brene Brown for a minute. <laughs> totally. That's in lean into vulnerability. If you would have heard that while you were in a company, what would your gut reaction have been? Just oh my that goodness. Sentence. That sounds, that sounds like a, a horribly weak thing to do it's right you know and I here's the thing though Suzanne is like I what I am and have always been a very vulnerable person I thought that was a failure right yeah. it's not oh gosh it's everything it's your superpower it, it is. is yeah there is there's so many people out there that pretend to be 
Um, let's just take the ballet and dance world. I mean, mm -hmm. it is pretending to be something that it's absolutely not. And um, being in it, of course, it is very, very tempting to adapt that kind of energy. And if you're completely the opposite, it makes it so much harder. It's like, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't fit. You know, yeah. I was always told, you know, you, you um, your feelings are, they're too much. You're just <laughs> too, too loud about the way you feel. Um, and then I stopped sharing and then I stopped feeling and then I found alcohol and I found other things and I found weed and you know, wow, it will come out. It, everything will come out. It's just a matter um, how much you allow it. And, and if you're not, it's just going to be, the explosion is going to be bigger. I totally agree with that. And it's interesting. We talk a lot about, the, you know, how dance helps you in life and it does, right? There's so oh, yeah. many incredible things about dance that, help you but I would also argue not to be a negative Nelly but for those people who are feeling like they don't quite fit in dance especially in this way that that you and I are discussing right now those things that make you unique and special will also serve you right um your vulnerability will serve you your empathy will serve you um I mean taking that internship at dance magazine changed my life. Like it changed the whole course of my life. And it has led me to doing some of the most meaningful things I could even imagine, right. To, to finding a feeling of, of purpose that is not identity, right. Like it, it's based in my beliefs. It's not based in who I am. And if to walk into that, that um, office that day, with the emotional, with the way I felt about dance at the time. I mean, that was terrifying. It took remarkable vulnerability to do it. I kind of can't believe I did. <laughs> but, well, that's where intuition, you know, just takes the hand or the driver's seat or like whatever you want to call it. Um, and actually that's what is the best for you at that moment if you really allow it mm -hmm. you what did you just say i wanted to um put my two cents in there um about purpose about yeah no not coming about the things that uh that make you feel like the other in dance may also serve you y yes it's when your worthiness does not rely on other opinions. Mm -hmm. And I find particularly, I had to learn this and it was a really, really hard road to recovery. And I'm still learning on not putting my own worthiness and my feeling around who I am and what I want into anybody else's hands but my own. Um, yeah, and I'm gonna leave it at that, I can see. If there's a lot you want to add. You go there's, right ahead, my love. No, there's so much. I mean, again, I'm going back to Dr. Scavarla, who's one of one of my collaborators with Minding the Gap. Um, but something she, when we work with dancers, something that she's asked them before is, who's on your board of directors? Mm. So think about the board of directors that lives in your head. Essentially, the guidance and opinions that matter to you. Mm. Who put them there? Did you put them there? Is there someone at that table that you did not put there? Yeah. Why is that person there? Is it because they have a title and power? Or is it because you genuinely care about their opinion and feel that they care about you? So that's crazy. I mean, that, I think about young me, like that is like, I don't know, that is radical, man. Like this idea that that I get to choose who, whose opinion matters? Right. Of course you do, it's your life. <laughs> yeah, of course it is. But like, let's go back and in, in, in the training, like how many times, I, I was never ever aware that everything I want is my choice. Mm. And that nobody else has that seat at the, in the driver's seat and, I get to choose who's on my 
table, who is running my life. I'm the CEO of my life. And I had for the longest time diverted that responsibility and that that honor to other people because I had no idea I had that power. Because it was always taken away from me by saying, you're not, you're too big, you're fat, you gained a kilo, holy moly, you can't take class, um, you're ugly, your breasts are jiggling when you bray, um, you know, all these little things that that just get so big if you keep um, applying them over and over and over. You start believing if you don't have the tools. Absolutely. And that's where it is so important. Like that, that's one part of, I feel, the shift on my dog. She's on the podcast today. <laughs> to the podcast. <laughs> wants to be heard as well um that is where the shift i feel that's one avenue where you know we could make a difference right now Mm -hmm. right now today we don't have to wait for funding we don't have to wait for for anything like that shift is in on the internet it is in coaches out there all you have to do is open up your eyes Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and wanting to change something and understanding that suffering is not supposed to be part of the journey to your dream i'm not talking about hard work Mm -hmm. i'm talking about suffering and and putting suffering on the top of the pyramid like if you want to be a good dancer you have to hurt you have to suffer and that isn't the truth you don't i a hundred percent and yes there's this idea that you know whoever's, you know, dancing through an injury is somehow heroic, right? Um, and I you know, rolled my eyes. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I rolled. <laughs> and, and I remember as a young dancer, even thinking the dancers who had eating disorders must love dance more than I did, right? Because they, they could do that. Oh my gosh. No. They hurt themselves that much, right? Like it yes. was almost like a, a medal Ooh, I have an eating disorder. Ooh, I went to go puke with my friends last night after we binge eat, you know, ice cream and chips. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, and that's why it's, it, it can be so, you know, that's why the, the way, wow, this is a rabbit hole, but that's why the way we talk <laughs> about <laughs> bodies and food, <laughs> the way we talk about bodies and food needs to change so dramatically in dance. I mean, you know, the impulse being, well, you know, you're worried about someone's eating, well, you're looking really thin. That's not discouraging them, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, so much, and I, maybe this is, this is a connection I have between this mental health work and, and writing is like, so much of it is about language. It's, it's just about language. It's about word choice. It's about being intentional with our words, you know? Um, so that's my little revelation for today. I had never made that connection. <laughs> so if you, um, and I, I am coming from a deepest place of love here, and I'm also going to take myself as an example. When you look at dancers that step into leadership positions and they're standing in a studio and they're trying to explain what they really want from the other side, mm-hmm. it, it, nothing comes out. They're showing 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 and say do so do it like this it needs to look like this this is this is how it feels you just need to stretch and it needs to hurt here and hurt there Mm -hmm. um but there is not the ability to really express your feelings and your emotions through words because you never learned how to do that because you actually denied yourself the feelings and the emotions Mm -hmm. and then how can you put them in words right um, so many dancers don't like to dance, uh, to dance, to speak. Um, so many dancers, when they're actually in a position to talk, just nothing comes out. Mm. Um, and you know what? It was for me the same way. I did not have a voice. I didn't mm. even think I needed to have a voice. Right. It took me three years to come up with Point to Rise because it's like, oh, oh my God, what if? Mm-hmm. And then the rabbit hole was really, 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 really deep. And I'm just coming out of it. Like I'm peeking my head through it. And 
that is where we should make a difference, you know, like, yeah. Well, in the way that, you know, especially from the perspective of like teachers and dance leadership, like the way, the way that we were taught, you know, the way a teacher was taught was, was never really disrupted outside of the dance bubble. Right. It, it, it just perpetuates and the, the words coming out of our mouths are often the same words that came out of our teacher's mouths and et cetera, et cetera. And we can, in that way, very unknowingly pass on trauma. Um, and, and there's almost this idea that like, going back to this idea of it has to be this, you have to suffer, right? Yeah. Well, that's how it's done. That's how um I was taught that's how you make resilient dancers right I mean it's I have to prepare my favorite one I have to prepare them for what it's like to be a professional dancer yes. Yes. thank you for bringing that up I don't, I actually that's still in my like deepest corner of my soul I put that away by yeah. far I mean and it's just like well that's that's some really dysfunctional energy you've got going on there if you're like I have to be mean and borderline abusive to these young dancers because I need to prepare them for the abuse the they're going to get as professionals. How about we just direct that energy where it needs to go, which is towards why is it like that? Yeah. Dance is hard enough. Yeah. It's hard just to just to do it well. <laughs> it is hard. You know what? It's so but hard. We want it. We want it. Like we we live for it. Mm -hmm but we shouldn't be encountering all the suffering and the pain and the abuse because that has nothing to do with beauty. It has nothing to do with the, the ethereal um, dreamlike ballerina set that, you know, dancers are powerful beings, mm -hmm. man. And if they would just understand that taking all of their power back, being so afraid to shine, they're not living even like an inch into their potential. They're cutting yeah. themselves short. That career is so short. And if you're not stepping into your full power, I'm sorry, regret is something that I do not wish up on anybody mm -hmm. after stepping off the stage. Because I felt what that felt like. And I had to really hard put some hard, hard work into not feeling regret. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, there's no, and there's no easy way to leave, to leave dance, you know, whether it's, mm. it's like, there's no, even when it looks like a storybook ending, it's not, you know, um, even if it seems like, oh, well, she didn't take it that far. He, he, you know, it, there's no, if you love this, there's no easy way, mm. right. To, to step away from it at all. Um, but I think, um, there's also a lot to learn from that experience. So, oh God, okay, <laughs> we're we're riffing. We're <laughs> we tell you a cup of tea or coffee or whatever you're drinking right now. Okay. <laughs> Let's get into your company. I want to talk about how, where did this come from? Um, what has your journey been like, and where do you want to go? Okay, so. So where it came from um, was I wrote an article in 2017 called Why Are We Still So Bad at Addressing Dancers' Mental Health that I shared my personal story in um, uh, around my mental health. And then also just after doing hundreds of interviews with dancers and mental health professionals and, and such, I, I had come to these very, like, I was like, there's this, these little things we can do that will really change start to change at least the mental health of dancers and the environment and so i i, I wrote this article and um it went viral it's it's one of the most read articles they've ever published which was absolutely dumbfounding to me um it was very comforting like hey i guess people relate to you like you're not some weak loser <laughs> right like but yeah. At the same time, it was like, wow, I did not need this much company in this. This is not, this is not okay, right? That so many people, re you know, relate to this experience. So 
Mining the Gap was really born out of that um, because I had people reaching out to me from all over the world, like dancers and mental health professionals and teachers and saying, we're with you, like, let's do this. How are we going to change it? And I was kind of like, oh, oh, I guess I need to, oh, so I'm going to, I got to figure that out. Okay. <laughs> um, for me, it was like, it was, it felt like a, it was like a moral mandate. It was like, I was seeing this so clearly mm -hmm. and because of my writing have connections, you know, with people and know the mental health professionals that specialize in working with dancers and can pick up the phone and call them at any moment. And, you know, so I was like, okay, let's, let's figure this out. Um, and so in terms of kind of how it's going, um, you know, Minding the Gap officially launched, it, I got the LLC for it in 2019, though, of course, there was a lot of work leading up to that. Um, and in the same year, I was accepted into um, a startup incubator here in, in Pittsburgh, which was a really amazing experience because, well, first, I've never been an entrepreneur before. Um, and second, you know, my professional background outside of writing is in nonprofit fundraising. So transitioning my mindset from the nonprofit world to the entrepreneurial startup world was massive. It was a massive step. Um, I realized, I mean, and I think one of the things I've learned most about being an entrepreneur that, that I've taken away is like, perfect is the enemy of good, right? Like I could waste a whole bunch of time trying to create, not waste, but oh, no, I could- Oh, it's a waste. Yeah. I'm, I'm telling you, <laughs> through my entrepreneurial journey, we get ready to get ready to get ready. So yes. perfect does not exist. Like nothing's, nothing's ever finished. No, no, you don't. You spend a day on an email, crafting an email, and then time is money. Time is so valuable. That is the only resource that is not renewable. So done is better than perfect. My yeah, if, burn. Yeah. I totally agree with you. And, and honestly, if I had held on to my perfectionistic striving, <laughs> like <laughs> I don't think binding the gap would exist because, and, and it's hard for me, right? Like it's hard for me to like, well, this video isn't perfect, but you know what it's going on. It's got to just got to go up. You know, it's, it, it's so I, I don't know. That's been an interesting learning, but um. So we, I did this incubator um, and this whole time I've been like hungry for data because when I talk to leadership often, I feel that there's, there's some of them that, that want to believe this is my opinion. Well, that's your opinion. You know, I hear that a lot. That's your opinion. That was your experience. It's not like that here. Um, we know a psychologist, um, you know, all these things um, that they run the gauntlet from, well, I'm sorry, you had a rough time. And I'm like, that's not what this is about. Like, I'm, <laughs> you're not hearing um, me. You're not, Listen. no, you're not, you're not listening <laughs> to um, who knows what this would dig up. That's my favorite one. Oh, good one. Oh yeah. yeah. Ouch. Wow. I was, this, like, I was like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Super healthy. <laughs> Super healthy. Um, but essentially, I, I, I was frustrated that there's not enough data, especially in the United States. So there is some really amazing, and I don't want to say there's no data, there's some amazing researchers out there doing amazing work, right? But they can only produce so much data, this right. small group, right? Um, and a lot of it is happening, most of it is happening in the UK and Australia. Um, so there's, there's not as much data on dancers in the United States. Um, though looking up uh, Dr. Paula Thompson and Dr. Victoria Jacques, if anyone's interested in some fascinating data about dancers in the United States, they've done some. Um, there's a lot around eating disorders and perfectionism, but there's not a ton around anxiety and depression, like these kind of core building block issues that lead to those things or contribute to those things. And I really felt like I need some data to be like, look, this isn't my opinion. Here's some data. <laughs> um, and so I wasn't finding exactly what I wanted. So that's kind of where the kind of research aspect of Mining the Gap came from. Um, we've done several kind of informal surveys 
on um, one was on the Dance Magazine website and one was on um, on our own social channels. Um, and then we're actively participating in two um, IRB approved like clinical research projects right now. Um, so the, the research part of Mining the Gap is very important to me because I feel like it brings things to light. Like, let's just bring this out in the light. Like the emperor isn't wearing any clothes, you guys. Like, let's talk about it, you know? Um, then uh, the other aspect of it is wanting to create meaningful programs. I mean, our mission is to see mental health regarded with the same seriousness as physical health and dance culture. Um, I believe that that requires systemic change. You know, there are great mental health professionals and coaches and, and every, you know, out there working one-on-one -on -one with dancers, which I think is so important. Um, I, I believe, you know, it's important to address the individual, but if that individual is then turning around and walking back into a dance environment that is toxic um, or doesn't fully understand crafting language to minimize trauma, then they're just getting, it's a cycle of getting hurt over and over and over again. Um, you know, I also think that current and former dancers are the majority of the dance audience and we need to honor the dancers in our schools and companies like they are the, the financial livelihood of this art form because they are. And so let's create like dancers who, when they move on from dance, don't avoid going to a performance for three years like me. <laughs> <laughs> um, or like me yeah yeah I the only reason I, I started going I mean aside from having friends who are still dancing was was writing about dance I had to <laughs> um wow so anyway so we I want to develop programs that that can help to institutions to fundamentally change the culture of their schools to include mental health culture. And that includes a lot of work with teachers and leadership that includes work with dancers because it really is more complicated than, oh, well, here's, here's our psychologist, go talk to that person. They're not going to go, no. you know, you um, to that either, right? Like it is psychologist sounds like I'm broken. I need a doctor or something mm -hmm. like there's still the stigma around it. And, and, there and is just something special about dancers. Like if mm -hmm. you haven't been really in, in there in the mold from like top to bottom um, to understand what it feels like, like it needs to be a specific psychologist, a specific coach. I think that's true. I do think, um, I do think it's possible to see someone who was not a dancer themselves, who's, mm -hmm. who is very capable of, being helpful. And in some ways it's sometimes helpful to have that person. I was talking to a dancer the other day that was talking about their therapist who has never been a dancer, but you know, has worked with athletes and such. Yeah. And some of the things she's like, some of the things that I say, like her surprise or her like reckoning with wait, So this is culturally normal. Her surprise actually kind of straightens me out a little bit, right? Like, it's like, Oh, oh, like, is it like checks you? It checks like, no, you know what? That's not, that shouldn't be normal, <laughs> you know, quote normal. Um, so I think it, it has, I agree with you. It has to be the right person. Um, but I think it's interesting to see there are lots of different ways for people to get to being that right person. Um, but I do think that anyone, even if they have experience in similar pursuits, like I actually think, um, gymnastics, obviously, um, baseball, minor league baseball has some very interesting parallels to what it feels like to be a dancer. <laughs> football. Yeah. Football, um, uh, swimming and track, you know, um, you know, if people get, if the, the professional understands those things, they need to come into the studio, right? They need to spend some time in a dance studio and they need to kind of come to performances and kind of make themselves familiar. Um, but yeah, sorry, I went on a big tangent with that. <laughs> no, 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 this is awesome. Thank you. Um, so do you, and let me back up before I really ask that question and, and I wanna, 
I want to have our listeners understand where that's coming from. From being an entrepreneur, leading my own businesses, um, being in corporate America and being a dancer before, one would think, or the assumption is that it is like a whole world in between, okay? I do found that my training as a dancer has set me up the very best to be an entrepreneur. There are things that I'm missing as an entrepreneur is the, the perfectionism, like making quick decisions, um, self-esteem and believing in yourself. You know, you really need that as an entrepreneur. But the discipline and the ability to um, analyze and it, it goes in both ways, um, to problem solve, all of that really if I hadn't had that training, I would not be where I am today. Um, and I yeah. was wondering if you can relate to that or like share your thoughts on that. I can, yeah. I mean, it's interesting, you know, because I, I talk a lot about identity and I and I give dancers a very hard time about needing to diversify their identity and oh, yeah. and it should be multifaceted and it should be a pretty long list and not just a like where t i am a dancer like on your t-shirt like you know um but an absolutely intrinsic part of my identity is that i was a dancer it always will be it is it is my dna <laughs> you know um it and it has shaped me in both very positive and very negative ways you know, as anything that you immerse yourself completely in can. Um, I think that when it comes to being an entrepreneur, you have to be creative. And I know this is going to sound silly, but there is something about being a person who learned how to move your body through space, who learned how to fall correctly, physically fall correctly, who learned how to land a jump and a turn and all the, I know this sounds silly, but I just feel like there's this connection between kind of getting yourself off kilter like that and creativity. Yeah. And I think that that definitely is kind of programmed into your brain. Um, I think that I, I mean, I am like a dog with a bone. Like I'm not I'm not putting this down like, <laughs> and that also comes from dance. I mean, I hate Petit Allegro, but I did it almost every day of my life for almost 20 years. You know what I'm saying? But like, yeah. you gotta do that to do everything else. Yeah. And so I think that that, when we talk about how resilient dancers are, that's the kind of resilience we should be looking at. Not she can handle getting yelled at in rehearsal. No. She That's can do Petit Allegro, even though she hates it. <laughs> exactly. She knows that the things that don't bring her joy are still something that she needs to do in order to move forward. Yes. And I mean, you know, there's this kind of idea of like, what is that, that kind of phrase? It's like, uh, if you love it, you'll never work a day in your life kind of thing. You know, this yeah. kind of idea that like, if you can find that job you love, you're never working. I'm calling BS on that a little bit. Like every job has moments or things that like you just don't want to do, but are absolutely vital to what you're doing. And I think dancers are really good at that. We're really, really good at that. Um, I hate transcribing interviews. Oh my goodness. Like I can procrastinate transcribing an interview like you can't even imagine. And, um, and yet it's an absolutely vital part of my writing process. Like if I were to have someone else transcribe it, the, the, the art of putting together that story and weaving together that narrative, that is happening while I'm sitting there typing out every word each person I interviewed said. That's where I start seeing the, the fabric and the links and the, the important salient consistencies. Right. Um, so that's just an example. But I think that serves me in everything. And I do think that comes from dance. I think that fortitude comes from dance. I want to add something to that. I, I thought that I had to do everything by myself. <laughs> so, you know, but, and that, that is also typical dancer mind. Like don't ask for help because that shows vulnerability, which equals weakness. And therefore we don't do that. So 
this is a process I am still not great at asking for help. Um, and what I learned is by not doing it, I am actually slowing myself, my process of self-development and my process of like building a business, I'm slowing it down to almost zero because I'm now all of a sudden not living in joy and I am putting like a big stone on my creativity. And absolutely, that, right? Now you understand that transcribing your interviews is a process of how you're putting together the story because you're hearing every word over and over and over again. And that is how you're painting the pictures in your head, right? And that's mm -hmm. that's your creative process, even though you don't like it, particularly, you still love it and you still know it is necessary. And then there are things that I will not do anymore because they suck every single bit of energy out of me and I am not good for anything. And that was a process that I had to learn, like admitting that I am not great at everything. That was mm -hmm. the hardest part in stepping into entrepreneurship. The first mastermind round that I went through with um, Lauren and Chris Harder, it was a big thing like ask for help. I was like, what? What do you mean? Ask for help. <laughs> What's that? No, no, yeah. Susie, you need to learn how to ask for help. It's like, I can't, I'm going to die. Yeah. Oh man, the worst. Yeah, it's, it, it is a hard thing. Um, I think the, on kind of on the other side of that, I think it's also learning, you can't be everything to everyone, you know? So it's like, cause you know, it, it's hard. Like people, people will re reach out to me and they, they want me to collaborate on something or they, they want to talk with, you know, and, and I want to, to give all of myself to all of these people, but I can't physically please everyone you know it's it's and that's hard too and that's another part of being an entrepreneur I think um it's part of when you're you know when you're building a business it's part of understanding what you are but also understanding what you're not yeah and creating boundaries I mean those are things I think you have to do as an entrepreneur for sure as a human as a dancer <laughs> you need to know how to create boundaries you know, yes. it is the savior of your existence. If you don't have any boundaries, you just floating in space and you never know what you're going to bump into. Like even for yourself, like, right. Like how far do I get? What do I accept? What do I not accept? What are my values? What are my goals? These are boundaries too. Mm -hmm. And in the dance world, I like when I was first introduced to the concept, I was like, what do you mean? Like I, I was just the person that fit perfectly into a classical Bali company. That's that's who I was. Mm -hmm. And when you're asking me about my boundaries, I was like, well, um, there were their boundaries. They weren't my boundaries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that is where we are so missing out on the the thought process of being a like being able to learn over and over again and to consistently grow, um, that's not something that is really seen as, as necessary in a world of Bali. Like you, you just have to be perfect. You come out of school and you, you are perfect. Mm -hmm. And there's no room for learning. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's got a... We are yeah. changing it. You are, I am, everybody right now that is stepping into that space and starting to speak up we all make a change and that what matters. I agree. And you know what, this is a really, really large ship and it's going to take a lot of water to raise it. So everyone who has it in their, in their ability to, um, to be expressive about this, to, to work towards changing this, like we need all the troops. <laughs> we, need, we do. Yeah. We need everyone. We really do. And everyone brings something kind of different and special to the conversation um, and different skills. And I, it's, it's actually been wonderful to, to see over the last few years, um, the more kind of kindred spirits I find um, like yourself and, and others who live and breathe this, you know, for a while I felt very alone in this, you know. Yeah, yep. That's the other also. thing, entrepreneurship can be lonely. <laughs> Oh, honey, it is lonely if you don't know how to ask for help. 
<laughs> but then so is being a dancer. Mm -hmm. It is yeah. very lonely. The, the second you step outside of your, your studio or your off the stage, mm -hmm. man, you're, yeah. you're on your own love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is why it is so important to, to speak up. This is why it is so important to reach out and ask for help. This is why it's so important to, you know, surround yourself with people that actually lift you up that are outside of your bubble. So you can see what other worlds are out there. This is where mm -hmm. diversity comes in. Um, mm -hmm. It is so important. It absolutely is. Um, it's a whole rabbit hole I want to open there, but I'm not going to do it because we'll, <laughs> we'll take it. <laughs> okay, it's a very long episode. Go refresh your copy. Before we um, get off this interview, um, everything and anything you're doing will be linked in the show notes. Um, if there's anything that, like, do you have anything upcoming that we, we should be talking about? Mm. Yeah, so, I mean, there are a couple things on the website that I think can be helpful for people. Um, the beginning of the pandemic, I started something called um, the Mental Health Town Hall series. Um, I ended up doing three of those and they're, they're recorded interviews on various topics related to kind of dancers living through this pandemic. And um, so we did one that was on, um, that was on, on um, what was it? It was on identity, yeah. Um, so we had like Biscuit Ballerina, on with Dr. Brian Goonan, who's one of my collaborators. We did one on food and body image with Catherine Morgan. Um, we did one on when um, when COVID-19 means it's over, when, you know, there's so many dancers that have been forced into retirement because of this or have retired with no fanfare or have, don't know if they're retired. You know, like there's so much closure that's being lost right now. So that was part of it too. Um, so that's on wearemindingthegap.org under resources town hall. Um, that resources page, that main resources page also has tons and tons of phone numbers and links to resources that are available, mental health resources that are available to people, um, hotlines, et cetera. So if someone's feeling lost <laughs> and they don't, they don't know really what that first step can be, um, there, there's, there's a first step on that page, you know? So I hope that they will look at that. Um, and then also we've, we've talked about identity a lot in our conversation today. Um, and so I'm about to launch, um, a diversifying identity kind of conversation series, video series. Um, and in the first one, I interview the editor in chief of dance magazine and the editor in chief of point. And it's the three of us kind of discussing, how we got into dance writing and what, you know, how to write a good pitch and what your editor's looking for and, and all these things, because I find a lot of dancers have been reaching out, wanting to know about, about my writing, wanting to know about mental health careers, because, you know, one of the quote silver linings in all of this is that we're spending more time kind of with ourselves, having to imagine a life outside of dance. And while that's incredibly painful, I think it's also incredibly healthy. And so I want to, to help with that. And, um, you know, just this is, this is the time to, to imagine, you know, and, and seek out the, the other things that make you happy. And ask all the questions, just don't yes. settle, you know, just don't, yeah. don't even think about settling. Mm -hmm. um, excellent. I want to um, close today off with quoting you, the last sentences of your current article. We're launching this episode later on in the month, but today is March 3rd and this article came out on the 1st of March in Dance Magazine. Um, Dance is a grand old house that has been devastated by a natural disaster, but after the storm comes the opportunity to rebuild. Do we want to get out the old blueprints and rebuild it exactly the way that it was? Asked Milner. Are we trying to restore a historic landmark that is reverted and admired, but isn't really lived in? Or are we going to take the time to ask what we can improve? Yeah, and that was a quote by Jennifer Milner, who's an incredibly incredible uh, Pilates 
instructor and dance coach. She's incredibly inspiring, wonderful woman. Um, and I mean, she is good with an analogy. <laughs> oh man, this is a really, really, really beautiful. Yeah. She's fantastic. Yeah. Um, and she's a hundred percent right. Let's, 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 let's remodel, please. <laughs> we yeah. need to remodel. Totally from the ground up. Like it yeah. doesn't, it doesn't matter how long it takes. Like let's just do it right because that's that's the chance we've get. We've got this is right the moment. Now. Yeah, this is the moment, exactly. If mental health isn't gonna start mattering after a global pandemic that kept dancers out of the studio for over a year, I I don't know what other moment there is. It has to be now. Well, my mentor always says, you know, it will come if you're not taking care of it now while the two by four is tiny and, and just lightly, lightly taps you on the shoulder. And I think every economical crash that we've seen so far between 1980 and I would say now was a beautiful little tap on the shoulder. And now the pandemic is more the two by four in, in your face. Mm -hmm. And if it's not going to change, the two by four will be a 20 by 40 and it will really, really hurt. Mm -hmm. So it really is our choice on how big we want the pain to be. Mm -hmm. Like, are we going to make the pain short lived right now? I'm going to rip that bandaid off. Or are we going to choose to live in pain for the next 40 years? Yeah, I think. Um... I think we can do better. And I think the majority of the people in this art form want to do better. Um, I think it is gonna take courage, um, but I think dancers are courageous. So let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Courage from every single one. Like it's not just, you know, it's not just gonna happen for you like you need to have that will to change in yourself as well because as long as we have people playing along we're just giving that all system power yeah 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 agreed Kathleen thank you so much that again was such a great conversation I don't know why we didn't tape the first one but um <laughs> I wanted to thank you for taking that on it is such an important part and I understand more than perhaps most on what kind of an uphill battle that is and mm -hmm. how rewarding it can be. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to thank you for your courage. So don't ever give up. And if you need to have somebody that holds a big shoulder for you, I'm, I'm right here, sister. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Thank you. And thank you for the work that you do. It was great to be here today. <laughs> thank you, love. Right. Hi guys, thanks for listening. Thank you so much for listening. If this message resonates with you, please pass it on to someone who needs to hear this right now. And if you like what you've heard, your feedback will go a very long way. If you just take 30 seconds and leave me a five-star review, that would mean the world to me. Till next time, point at yourself to rise to all that you are capable of.